morning, everyone. My name's Julio, and I am an alcoholic. And there's a bus with my name on it waiting. <laughs> Um, as, um, and as the custom is here, my um, sobriety date is February 1st, uh, 1993, and my home group is a Carlisle group in Manhattan. So, if you're ever in New York, that's a great group to stop by. As um, Steve was mentioning, I'm also very privileged to be a member of the staff at the, your general service office in New York. If I, um, and that's something that is really one of the biggest gifts of sobriety. And it didn't happen of, because of anything that I did except following my sponsor's direction all the way to the point that he said, this is what you have to do. Uh, why should I do it? This is what you have to do. And here I am. So I'm, you know, he's since passed on. And, but every time that I get the opportunity to talk about the office, it's connected to, the, to many of the gifts that I got through following his directions. Um, the office is located in New York, but it's our office. It's everyone's office. It's there to provide services for Alcoholics Anonymous, for the groups, for the members, to provide information about Alcoholics Anonymous and to print our literature. When members come and visit, it's a highlight of the day. Anytime a member comes by, we get the opportunity to tell you what happens with your contributions, what the office does on behalf of Alcoholics Anonymous, and hopefully we maintain that original spirit of communication that was Bill's original intent when he created the office, started the office in the late 30s. So we are perhaps bigger, larger, uh, more technology, but the spirit of communication from one alcoholic to another still, still is really the, one of the basic principles that we try to follow. Um, we have a meeting, an Alcoholics Anonymous meeting at 11 on uh, Friday. Uh, as I said, it's, uh, the address is 475 Riverside Drive. It's 120th and, and Riverside in New York. So if you're ever there, please come and visit us. It'll make uh, the highlight of the day if you do, so please. Um, now my story, in a general way. Um, as I was, I always remember that for me, working at the office, one of the greatest things about it was that in order to apply, I had to go and tell them how much of a fall down drunk I was. <laughs> and that was really a first in my experience. I was, I was mostly trying to hide it here. I went into detail about how I went to bed and, and, and many of the other circumstances of my past life. So it was really kind of one of those added gifts. Um, but the story didn't start there. I, um, I am originally from the Dominican Republic and the Caribbean. I grew up in a family where alcohol was very seldom a topic of discussion. My parents weren't heavy drinkers or or har hardly ever drank at all. There were probably some alcoholism in the f extended family. I had an uncle who was probably an alcoholic, uh, in my view, um, even, you know, I can't speak for him, but there was pretty much all the signs were there. And in the family, the, the one comment that we had about him was that the problem was that he didn't work. I mean, their drinking was not a problem, but he didn't have a job, so, I sort of like had the sense, that I got a message that as long as I could hang on to a job and a surface life, you know, it was okay to drink. And I went to drinking fairly early. I, and back home, there's not a lot of problems about getting a drink. If you can reach the counter and you have the money, you can buy a bottle. So and that was not a problem. And, I had cousins, friends, and, and we all at the age of 12, 13 were really experimenting and, and doing it. Everybody was doing it. So my first drinks were perhaps in those circumstances. And, and I can't sell, tell you that I liked alcohol the first time I drank. I probably managed to get sick a few times and, and couldn't really get uh, what was the big excitement about it. Everybody was doing it, so I, you know, I continued to hang out with the group and, and, and drank a few times on a few occasions. And as I said, it wasn't really a, 
I didn't see the, the point in it, except that I, keep try, I kept trying. And um, the moment for me of, of, of real, when alcohol really, really uh, started making a difference in my life was the first time that I felt the magic. Um, I wanted to say before I, I actually started that I wanted to thank the committee for inviting me. It's really been a privilege to be here. But I also wanted to thank the speakers that have spoken before me because uh, every time I hear a story in Alcoholics Anonymous, I, I, I wonder about how I, I ident identify the stories and the circumstances can always be so different, but I immediately identify with the feeling and there is an immediate connection and that's always been the most attractive part of Alcoholics Anonymous for me. So I do want to thank Tracy and Carl especially for their messages that really kind of made this weekend already special for me. But back to my story. Um, that first time that alcohol worked for me, I remember being at a party. It was a very fancy party back, I was probably 15 at that time. There was this big 15th year old celebration. A girl was celebra celebrating her quince, as they say back home. It's a big party. There was an orchestra. There were flowers in the pool. There was dancing. There was all the booze that you can drink. I mean, it was really a very fancy party. And in the middle of all that, all of a sudden, after a few drinks, I got the magic. I suddenly felt like I always wanted to feel. I felt part of the world. Up to that point, I had been a very stressed out, conflicted, tortured, as my sponsor would say, little boy. I, I just was never comfortable and not, you know, for many reasons or, or, or none, but I was never comfortable in my own skin. After these drinks, I immediately felt part of the world. I felt funny. I felt relaxed. I was dancing well, I thought. <laughs> I was singing even better. Uh, we I was part of a group that went up to the orchestra. We sang with the orchestra. We danced in the front of the orchestra. I danced with the girl that was celebrating her birthday. I danced with her mother. I was the biggest. I was the charm of the party. And I hadn't even been invited, so they didn't know who I was. <laughs> I just kept coming back. It, it was really... Uh, that kind of magic. Um, and I left that party on a cloud. And from that moment on, I, I don't think I made a conscious decision, but I knew that life was possible. I had found a solution, something that worked. I felt like even up to that point, I have never been able to feel this relaxed. So I knew that there was something there. And from that moment on, I, I really found opportunities, looked for opportunities to go to as many uh, parties or anything where I could get my hands on alcohol, and I drank as much as I could. And the, when I was initially sober, I would tell that the story and say that I drank socially for a few years, but I don't think I ever drank socially. I never drank two or three drinks. I always drank for effect. But for a few years, I managed to do it without getting myself into trouble or getting myself into any circumstances uh, that would really kind of affect my life. So I drank successfully, perhaps, for a few years. But by the time I was 20, um, my drinking took a turn. And I, 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 even I described it differently because I would always tell people that I was going to a party, but by the time I was 20, I was telling people I was going out drinking because drinking was what I wanted to do. Now, if you, there was not going to be any drinking at the event, I was not going. If there was not enough booze of any kind at that event, I wasn't really inclined to go. My purpose was to really get to the booze and feel good. And that was really the, my only purpose. And even at that age, at 20, I was already aware that my drinking was different. I knew that I wouldn't drink at noon or 
during the day because I knew once I started to drink, the compulsion set in, and I would just continue. I knew that I, if I really had something to do, I better not start drinking. But once I started to drink, all bets were off. I was not available the next day for sure. So I, at that time, without even thinking I had a problem, I was already making, managing my life around the alcohol. Um, I was a big blackout drinker, and blackouts became a big part of my story. I remember my very first blackout as clearly as I remember my first really successful drunk. Um, the first time I had a blackout, I remember drinking all night and being perfectly in, you know, knowing what I was doing up to the moment I got home. And then I went into a blackout. And the next day they found me. I was sleeping in the closet in the back room with a bathing suit on backwards. <laughs> I don't know what the plan was. <laughs> they found me because I snore, so it was one of those things that I said, uh oh. And actually, my family didn't, and I was living at home then, my family didn't really get on my case about it, but actually, I got a little scared, but not scared enough to stop my drinking. I just was more aware of it. But from that moment on, my blackouts uh, and my drinking just became uh, worse. I started yeah, not only drinking more, but also uh, the consequences started getting uh, a little bit um, bigger. Um, uh, living at home, I was confronted by my mother, who had a very high-pitched style of addressing things. Uh, <laughs> and by my father, who was very reasonable and, and, and soft-spoken, and neither approach worked with, for me. If the problem was that I was going out and in, in the, using the car and they were worried about that, I left the car at home. If there was another concern, I addressed but nothing could get in the way of me drinking. At that point, that was the only thing that worked it for me, and that's how I saw it. I saw that this was, was keeping me alive. The thought, that I, the thought that I wouldn't drink was really not even uh, a possibility. So I you know, muddled through those uh, couple years, and as uh, my case, my drinking just got worse, and it was just not getting out of it. What happened? Okay, is that the bus? <laughs> Let me know. The the uh, you know I, I, one of those days I I just woke up one day after really going through my own routine of going out getting back home the next day, not knowing what I had done, always kind of having half a sense of that I was in some kind of trouble because I couldn't, if I, the phone rang, I, I, would, I didn't know if I was happy or unhappy, if people were talking to me or not talking to me or what did they want to tell me. And, and I would kind of, if I did go out and use my father's car, I would look at the car, make sure it was there check the bed, make sure it was dry, or it was really that kind of life, and it was really just one more time after many times doing that, and of this particular morning, I just decided that I, I, was, I needed to do something, I needed to look for help, and I, my f solution at that time was to look for a psychologist, and because in my mind, I was, I had so many conflicts, I had so many problems, I had so many difficulties, that I had to solve them. And I actually thought that if I did that, if I actually resolved all these issues, these problems as I saw them, uh, I would be able to drink like a normal person because that's what was making my drinking different. So I went uh, to the psychologist and to my good fortune, I found someone who was not only a very gentle and smart man, but uh, also very uh, aware of Alcoholics Anonymous. So he heard my stories and continued to work with me, but from the beginning he started to point out to me that many of the times that I found myself in difficult situations, I had been drinking. So could I try 
by going out and uh, just having two drinks. So I did that. Um, it didn't work. Uh, I tried it too. So I, but I did in those days try everything that I could think of, including drinking things that I would normally drink. I tried beer because I didn't like beer, but you know, as I learned, it's an acquired taste. <laughs> you like them after two. <laughs> anything that I could think of, um, vermouth, uh, anything that I was really not fond of, I would drink. But as soon as I had a few drinks of any kind of alcohol in me, I was off. I just, that was it. So I, I, I kind of saw the, 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 that there was a, a difference in the way that I drank and other people drank because I would pride myself in not drinking with amateurs. I would only drink with people that I thought were serious about it as I was. And so when I was trying to follow some of these suggestions and control, see if I could control my drinking, I, I would sit at a table and see if other people, and I would say, well, I'll just have a sip when he has a sip. And I would sit there and just get a resentment. Because <laughs> these were the heavy drinkers. <laughs> And they were not moving fast enough for me. <laughs> so um, when this psychologist suggested that I meet someone from Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, and I didn't even know exactly what that, was, that meant at that time, I, I did. I went and met this gentleman, uh, and he uh, talked to me about going to a meeting with him. I went. I went to my first meeting back home. And there were a couple of things that I immediately felt when I, when I walked into that room. One, I felt welcome, and I felt a sense of hope. There was some sense that perhaps this, there was some kind of explanation to my life up to then and my drinking up to then. Um, the first step was really uh, of imp impact to me because it said uh, we were powerless over alcohol. And as much as I had tried to control my alcohol, I knew at that point that I was powerless over it. So I identified with that immediately. I also heard the concept that this is a disease, and that was a relief because at, up to that point, I really thought I was crazy and nobody had caught on. So it just explained, and, and, and then people told their stories, and I could identify with the way that they drank and with the way that they felt. I finally felt that I came into the planet where people spoke the language I understood. So that really made a difference in my life. And I started going to meetings, and I didn't drink, and I had uh, two years uh, of, of, of that sobriety back home. And my life really changed. My life got so much better. I finally was able, I was able to finish my, my studies. I, I graduated um, and decided to, to move to New York. What happened to me was that I really had a really appreciation for the solution that I found, but I had really no connection, no in-depth connection. I hadn't really felt necessary to do more than not drink and go to meetings. And I found that for me that was really kind of left me with, without that, that, that connection that, I, that I could have helped me. But the fact is that I, I didn't. You know, people in that group would talk about the steps, and, and I would call them the fanatics. <laughs> I mean, it's bad, but it's not that bad. And that was what I did. Um, I moved to New York. I, I lived in New York for about three years without drinking. Uh, it was a process, it was a dry process. And I immediately, you know, my life uh, was probably functional, but not that great. I was probably the, the driest, a very dry drunk at that time, until I found the friends, a social circle, I, I started going out. Um, and they would consider me very boring, because I didn't drink and I, or anything. So a friend of mine offer, offered me an alternative. And I went on this technicality that this was not alcohol and went on to some outside issues and found them really boring without the other 
component. So by the, uh, doing this, I already, it took me a few, I'm really saying maybe a few hours just to get to my first drink. And once I had my first drink in me, and this now combination of drugs and alcohol that I thought was the magic uh, solution, because now I could really drink like I wanted without getting into too much trouble, uh, I was off to the races. It just went off from there. Um, my drinking never was fun again. I really did drink for a, uh, for a few years. Uh, and. What I can tell you from that time in my life was that I call it the dark period, the very dark period, because it was reduced to, my life was reduced to work, drinking on Fridays and, and, and Saturdays and Sundays, trying to find a way to clean myself up to, like, so I could work on, on Monday. And it was always night drinking and the curtains were drawn and, and if the sun came out, it was really about just keeping those curtains shut and and then trying to go to sleep and and getting up and and, and it just my world was getting smaller and smaller and darker and darker and that's how I feel about it. I uh, by the time that I decided to look for help again, I was really doing just uh, even if I was in a circle of people, I wouldn't talk to anybody. I was just there trying to regain that sense of relaxation or that sense of freedom that alcohol gave me at the beginning without ever finding it again. But I still pursued it thinking that I could um, and without lo really thinking of the consequences. It was just dragging myself through a bottom, a very flat, low bottom. I. I don't know how long I would have gone, except for the fact that I, what changed it, what, what really woke me up was the fact that uh, one day I walked into my office on a Monday morning and there were people there that they were, they were talking and they were talking about a party that they had been on Saturday where I was as well. and. They were talking about things I did and laughing about it, and I didn't have a clue about what they were talking about. And I didn't have the, I didn't have the uh, courage to ask what it was. I, I just didn't want to know. I, was, I felt such shame and, and, and such remorse about it, everything that I just didn't find the courage to, to ask. And I asked. And, and I, I really had that moment of, of, you know, it's come, it's really hit me, and uh, and I decided to ask for help. Um, and at that time, I had a coworker who was uh, very new in sobriety. Uh, this was a girl that was about six months sober. She was, you know, I had seen her gotten, getting sober, and she would talk about it. And I knew the language. I knew she what she was talking about. So we would talk about it and. She was bright, she was happy, you could see the, 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 the glow, the, the, the shininess, uh, shiny eyes, and I hated her. <laughs> she was just too happy for me. <laughs> but, you know, uh, she was attractive. She, that ha had the attraction of sobriety. And I asked her for help, and, and she actually got me information for a meeting she coincidentally found a meeting that was a Spanish-speaking meeting in New York, and I went to that meeting that same night. And it was a good thing for me because it was not only the language that I speak, but also the language, the format that I was familiar with. I immediately felt welcome. I immediately felt comfortable. I got that sense of hope again, and I and I started going to this meeting, and I. I didn't drink, uh, and this was a process that I began again, and, and and I did it again for another full year without drinking, going to meetings, life got getting better, better job, I got, I moved to a new apartment, and the meetings weren't that convenient anymore. I couldn't really get there, it was really uncomfortable, and I didn't have that sense of AA is, uh, is bigger than that group, and 
as much as I liked it and, and, and as much as my life got better, I found myself drifting out again and getting into uh, and, and going back to, to drinking. And again, as bad as I, th I, I thought it was before, it got worse. It just got lonelier and it got darker. And at that time, I thought that this is it. I, I really um, found myself uh, at, a, at a point where this was not the worst of my drinking, perhaps. This was, but it was really the, the spiritual bottom for me. It was the emotional bottom. I had tried everything that I could think of to make this work. I wanted alcohol to work for me again. And as much as I tried, it didn't. And I really couldn't imagine living the way that I was living. And that was really the difference now, that the, the amount of, of pain and misery that I felt was all inside. And I really didn't know if I could go on living like that. But at the same time, I just didn't have the courage to end it. So the thought of continuing living like that was unbearable. And I remember that because I had moved to a new apartment. I, I, from the, on the way from the subway to my house, I, I would always go by a church that had a little AA sign on the door. And this was li really a glimmer of hope for me because somehow I kind of knew that AA was there, and I and I and I knew enough that that was still a possibility. That I had always been welcomed back, and when this moment came, when I really found myself at this at this point, uh, I decided to go down those steps to that basement in New York. It's always a church basement most of the time. I walked down those steps and sat in the back of the room. And again, I felt welcome. I got that sense of hope, and I felt OK, and I came back the next day. But what I found different this time in, in, in my experience was that I was finally at the point where I was able to accept suggestions. That I have, was given the gift of desperation. I was finally in enough pain that I accepted every suggestion that I was given. I found a sponsor who was really instrumental in, in, in my sobriety. He was the right kind of sponsor for me at that time. He was someone who asked me the what I thought was a very corny question of, um, are you willing to do anything? Are you really willing to go to any, any length? And even cornier was the fact that I said yes, <laughs> because that was probably not my instinct. But I was really, I meant it. I was willing to, to try anything. And I had really big expectations, because you know I would really go at him. I said, I, I want to feel good, and I want to feel happy, and, and what's going on? And, 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 and he said, you know, come down. and. And it takes, it's a process, and he really guided me to the steps. And I'm so grateful for, for meetings, as I said, because I hear in the rooms everything that I need to hear. And I had heard people talk about a design for living. And when he guided me through those steps, I really understood what they were talking about. This was really a design for living. I, I could live without alcohol if I follow these steps and be comfortable in my own skin. And my sponsor spoke a lot about uh, not happiness, like I would really want him to talk about, and all the cash and prices. <laughs> he spoke about being comfortable and of being useful. And that was a big uh, change for me. But it was very attractive. It was really what kept me listening and doing what he wanted me to do. I can't say, and I, I always want to say that I went through those steps like a real champion, but I probably fought tooth and nail, and much of it was driven by pain. I was really, whenever I was in pain, I was ready for a step. <laughs> and I would take it. And, 
And he would look at me and, and say, are you ready? Um, I would really say, well, if I was ready at the time, I would take it to the best of my ability. I also know that, you know, I don't have to make, do perfect quickly because I can always do them again. I have that ability to, and at different times in sobriety, the steps can have a different meaning. So, but the first time really counts for me because it was, gave me that option, gave me the, the sense that life was possible, that I could really be the person, a comfortable person in the world and feel good about myself without that drink. Um, he showed me, uh, he taught me about service, not so much about talking to me about it, but by, by example. He talked, he, I say he tricked me into doing the coffee in the group, and that's the biggest gift that I've ever got. And I really had a resentment about it for a little while because I wasn't keen on it, uh, but once I started doing that coffee, I really, I really felt the difference. I would buy the special brands of coffee. I would buy Bustelo if everybody was even a little electric at the meeting. Uh, I would um, buy the cookies. I would make designs on the table. If people came and took a cookie, I would come and fix my design. <laughs> I would stand by the table. I mean, <laughs> You had to talk about my coffee. Uh, <laughs> and some days, that you know, that's all I had. I, those were hard days. I was going through hard times at work where I was at that moment. And, and some days were really rough, but I knew I had to be there because I knew I had to make the coffee. And the group couldn't do anything without my coffee, so <laughs> I had to be there. And that carried me through the day. Uh, my second big resentment in AA was when they took that service away from me. <laughs> I thought that coffee pot was mine, but, but, but I did understand that, you know, I felt so much part of the group at that point that it was okay. I understood that others had the, needed the opportunity to do it too. And I went on to do other things that were perhaps always difficult, you know. Um, but once I did whatever I was asked to do, I felt better, not only that I was able to do it uh, perfect or imperfectly, uh, but I, I felt better after I did it. So I, I had a connection. I knew I, I, this service thing that people talked about meant something. And I didn't want to really get too scientific about it, but I knew that for the most part that I wanted to, every time that I was asked to do something, the automatic reply is yes. It's not my instinct. But if I say yes, uh, I'm in AA. I'm, I'm going to do the best I can to do whatever I'm asked to do. Um, and from there on, I, I just continued to do the best that I could in, in, in sobriety. Um, I got involved with intergroup service in, in New York and eventually came to work at, at, at the office, as, as I always talk about it, as a gift of sobriety, which is one of the gifts that I am most grateful for. At the office, I've been, I'd had the opportunity to, to really get to know people uh, in the fellowship, not only here in the U.S. and Canada, but also had the opportunity to travel a little bit on the international desk and meet fellowships in other countries. And it always is AA. It's Alcoholics Anonymous. It's one drunk talking to another. It's that message of love and hope that, that you find, that I found in, in those meetings. In my home group, I found them across the world. Um, I cannot really express how grateful I am for this journey that I've been given by just following simple directions. So I intend to continue to follow directions, even if it means getting on the bus now. <laughs> I know that's still a possibility, <laughs> but I do want to continue to do it. I want to thank you again for your hospitality. I do hope that if we can't meet over here, you'll come, you'll come and visit me in New York. And I want to publicly acknowledge all the, the great pleasure it's been to be hosted by Steve. Thank you so much.